This is going to be a quick everything you need to know about DeepSeek type video and the world of AI. If it was written, it might be called a white paper in some circles. And like that sort of thing, it's not an in-depth technical review of the topic, but instead it'll provide a sense of the technology, the AI business, the stock market connection, and how DeepSeek changed everything almost overnight. So let's get started. Well, what is AI? There are really two parts to AI. In its common form, it's when a computer can respond to questions in a chat box in such a way that you can't really tell if it's a computer or a human you're talking to. And that does mean a human sitting in front of a computer where they can use Google to answer any question you can come up with. I put in the last part because having an encyclopedic knowledge of everything might be a giveaway that it's not a human being, even if the conversation itself seems normal. There can be other interfaces as well, such as the ability to look at a photo or video and ask something like, is there an enemy tank in the photo? The military does have a great interest in AI and always has. By the way, the test for intelligence that I talked about is my rephrasing of the famous Turing test for intelligence. Even though the software is programmed, the information it has and the ability to respond is learned. AI systems are fed a vast amount of questions and told if the answer was correct, just like how we might teach a puppy. When it does something good, we give it a treat. As with human learning, AI should be able to respond reasonably to questions it has never seen before. And that's what artificial intelligence is, as opposed to just regurgitating information. What are terms like large language models and neural nets that often get tossed around? Well, those are the types of computerized mechanisms used to learn or remember the stuff the system is taught, and to use that knowledge to respond to questions. To some extent, those mechanisms mimic the operation of neurons in our brains, forming large meshes of interconnected cells. Well, of course, in this case, we're using the digitalized optimizations of that type of structure. Now, if you're not particularly interested in the how does it work part, just skip this section. All you really need to know is that a large amount of number crunching on computers is needed, often server farms worth of it. So a crude illustration of how it works is something like this. Every possible input, say an English word, is mapped to a list of random numbers. And we make an even larger list from the words in a sentence. Maybe we end up with a thousand numbers at this point. We do the same thing for every possible answer. We have a thousand numbers for the answer yes, and another thousand for no, and another thousand for aardvark, and so on. Maybe we have a million possible answers. You can see we're ending up with a lot of numbers. Now we take the numbers from our question and multiply them by the numbers of the first possible answer and add those multiplications together to get a result. That's a measure of how good the system thinks that answer is. And now we repeat that for the million other possible answers and their lists of numbers. And the answer that got the highest score is the one we chose. So, that's a lot of calculation, but the big question is, how do we select those numbers to produce good results? And that's where the learning comes in. Maybe we start with random numbers, ask a known question that we know the answer to, look at the answers, and if it's wrong, tweak a few numbers that we think are most likely to correct the result, and then we repeat this process with a bank of known questions and answers a gazillion more times. Now, it's actually more complicated than what I showed you because what I showed you won't actually exhibit intelligence. It's actually just a simple linear system. For AI, we need multiple layers of a setup like that where the outputs or answers of one layer go in as inputs to the next layer. We also have feedback loops where some of the outputs go back and are used as inputs to previous layers. And add to this some nonlinearity to the results of each layer. So they get distorted a bit like the way we overexpose a digital photo. Some of the information gets crunched together. Well, if we do all of that just right and teach it by tweaking the numbers properly, we start getting good answers. And in the end, it operates much in the way an interconnected group of neurons in our brain does. And it exhibits similar characteristics of 
well, in this case, artificial intelligent, like what I mentioned at the beginning of the video. You do need a vast amount of computer power for all of this, and a vast amount of data for training. One of the things that's really made AI practical has been the use of computers to generate large amounts of training data, rather than having to use real data, and to do this at speeds that we humans can't even imagine. So what differentiates the non-DeepSeq AI systems? Well, one aspect is how they structure those layers of calculations and how they teach them. As these models get large, it becomes very important to have layers structured to be most effective and also have some clever ways of knowing what numbers to tweak when training them. And that's not easy when you have feedback loops and nonlinearities mixed within the whole system. I'm going to call this the smarts, how clever a system is. The other aspect is the data the system is trained on. So if you're Google or Microsoft, you have access to vast amounts of questions and answers from your search engines, maps, and so forth. And you can use that to train your system and create a very knowledgeable system. For an AI upgrade of Google search, for instance, you need a vast amount of learned information. For a more specialized system, perhaps helping a company run its chat pop-up, you need a lot less information. I would call this the information component of AI. The different systems have different configurations of smarts and information, and they can often be selected appropriately for different applications. So where does DeepSeek come in? Remember the old saying that necessity is the mother of invention? Well, DeepSeek, being developed in China, was restricted from having the almost unlimited computing power available to its Western competitors. So instead of just using brute force with unimaginable quantities of numbers in their models and using all the data known to mankind to teach it, they seem to have decided to systematically go through those models and find ways or places to reduce the amount of computations and data that is needed without drastically reducing the effectiveness of the system. For example, one thing they apparently did was in some parts of their model reduce the precision of the numbers they stored. That is, they reduced the number of bits in each number. It looks like they did dozens of optimizations like that to reduce the amount of data of everything needed to about one-tenth of what is normally required. As expected, they did find that there was a reduction in accuracy of the results after doing all of this, but they then corrected that by some clever tweaking, including things like specialized learning to correct those inaccuracies. They also seem to have optimized things for smaller data sets. So instead of knowing everything, it looks like their system might be better at becoming a specialist, maybe a web chat that knows everything that an airline customer rep has access to. And there's a lot of money in applications like that. So why the sudden rise in AI and associated investments anyway? For that, you have to understand a bit about how speculative markets work in high tech. Every now and then there's a boom of some kind. Around 2000, there was the dot-com boom, then data mining, then the cloud, then the internet of things, for example, and now it's AI. At the beginning of a boom, money floods into that sector from investors of all sizes trying to get in on the ground floor. As time goes on, winners emerge and the capital and investment concentrates on them, and they inevitably end up buying the smaller players that may have useful technology as well. However, for a boom to happen, a bunch of things need to align. The market needs to be ready for the technology. There's no use having an Internet of Things if the world isn't already completely networked. And you also need underlying technology to exist. For example, for smartphones, you needed touch screens, low-powered CPUs, and lithium batteries. And all of them need to have reached a state of manufacturing maturity to make assembly of the first iPhone possible. AI has been around a long time. I was fascinated with it when I was a grad student over 30 years ago. Computers, however, were the unimaginable limitation. You could handle small arrays of numbers for tiny AI systems, but nothing close to the size of systems needed to handle the queries we expect to be able to manage today. Maybe if you had access to a supercomputer from the military, things were different, but for the rest of us, well, no way. 
computer graphics and cryptocurrencies have actually paved the way for what we have today. The graphics processors we have in our phones and PCs are designed to perform arithmetic on large groups of numbers at the same time so that they can synthesize computer game images in real time and in lifelike quality. That ability has been around for years, but with the rise of cryptocurrency mining, a need arose for that same type of computation, but without needing to display the results. And NVIDIA rode that wave, diversifying their business to include high-speed arithmetic processors without the actual display parts. So we ended up with unbelievably high computational speeds, exactly what was needed for AI to become practical. And NVIDIA was making smart decisions all along the way and has been laughing all the way to the bank. All of this has created effectively a barrier of entry into the high-tech area of AI. We had a bunch of small companies and some lucky ones like the creators of ChatGPT became the leaders with investments or partnerships from companies like Microsoft and they ended up with untold riches, both in the monetary sense but also in terms of the training data. And from that, they created those AI interfaces we're used to that have astonishing abilities. So to be able to compete these days, you now need not only to have the know-how to make a competitive AI engine, but the data source is equivalent to those from Microsoft or Google to train your system, and server farms filled with NVIDIA-equipped computers to carry out the vast amount of computations needed to service millions of queries a second. And that's a huge barrier of entry for any new participants. Although if they develop a useful technology, they can make a profit by getting bought, but they can never really compete with the big guys. And that's just fine with the Apples and Googles of the world. That's also why a handful of big tech companies recently announced with much fanfare that they're investing half a trillion dollars into AI, a large chunk of it going into AI data centers and the associated infrastructure needed to operate them. It'll be almost impossible for anyone anywhere to compete with that. Or so the markets thought and the stock prices of those associated companies did well. And with that optimism spreading even beyond high tech, apparently even natural gas companies went along for the ride based on the projected electrical power needs for those AI data centers. And then it all came crashing down with the emergence of DeepSeek. So how did DeepSeek scare the daylights out of the stock market? Well, NVIDIA was in the enviable position of being the premier supplier of the needed number crunching processors, and their stock went up with much anticipation of future sales. Anyone in AI or with AI connections did well, as mentioned. Suddenly, almost out of nowhere, it appears or is claimed that DeepSeek can do what the well-funded competition can do with one-tenth the resources, and that includes training and processing power. If that's true, using DeepSeek technology, someone with $50 million should be able to rival what the U.S. AI group can do with their $500 million. And $50 million really isn't that large amount of money to raise in high-tech circles. So, the market says, yikes, we overpaid tenfold. And someone else is poised to make all the money we expected to make ourselves. And... Maybe there won't be that huge demand for energy and we'll have a lot less demand for natural gas. And maybe, worst of all, we don't have that near monopoly we expected to have. And apparently, something around a trillion dollars or more of share value disappeared almost overnight. So how correct is that assessment? Well, it's hard to say. I'm not sure if at this point we know the full impact, large or small, of deep seek but the market sure thinks it knows. The scary thing that nobody is talking about is the rise of Chinese innovation in high tech. This market shock was accompanied by two firsts. It's highly unusual that in the middle of a boom like this, a tiny little rival seems to emerge and come out of nowhere and dethrone the well-established and well-funded leaders almost overnight. It may also be the first time that a Chinese tech company has challenged the Silicon Valley elite with innovation and surpassed them by leaps and bounds. Let me expand on that a little bit. 
Over the last 30 years, China seems to have evolved from simply copying foreign manufactured goods to creating their own highly successful companies like Alibaba and TikTok. But that's all from existing technology. But now, and here's the shocker, they're potentially exhibiting leapfrogging technology in the current hottest high-tech field with their own innovation. And that's a real wake-up call. China has a large enough economy to support the cost of innovation, so watch out. Are there any dangers from the China connection? Well, there are two parts of DeepSeek. The software itself is said to be open source and under an MIT license. If that's the case, and that means all of it is available under those conditions, this is absolutely huge. Software with an MIT license means anybody can download it, run it, generate their own AI system trained with it to do whatever they want and offer that as a service. It also means they can modify and improve the software and either keep it proprietary if they choose or learn from it and make an even better system. So there's a real opportunity for startups all over the world with this new technology. However, it might not be quite that smooth sailing there is probably a large sea of patents filed either by DeepSeek or various U.S. legacy AI companies, probably that cover key aspects of the technology, and that may serve to keep outsiders, well, out of the game. So probably there's not a huge Chinese danger here. The other part of the system is the online web interface and API. That system will give answers it's been trained for, and most likely there isn't anything intentionally nefarious there other than presumably complying with the Chinese government's twist on history or facts about that part of the world. But being foreign, there has to be a concern that there might be intentional misinformation included deep in the data. And if the online system is in widespread use, it could spread that misinformation. It could also be a vehicle to leak information back to China just from the nature of the questions and where they're asked, such as being asked from a certain government facility or inside a high-tech company. And there's also the dependency of using a China-based service to, say, provide an essential service within your business. If the service goes away, a business could be crippled. So is DeepSeek and the shockwaves from it a good or bad thing? Well, it's probably a great thing if it's as good as it's said to be. The advance in technology will push innovation in AI, either by using DeepSeek software directly or by learning from it. That half trillion that the high-tech moguls are investing in AI, well, it's not completely down the drain. If DeepSeek is 10 times better, it means that that half trillion dollars should be able to do 10 times as much as first hoped. And somehow we always seem to be able to consume every bit of computing power we have available to us and AI will be no exception. I think the main outcome may be those tech giants may not have the monopoly that they expected as a result of the hardware barrier to entry and of their closed source software. And just so you know, OpenAI is actually closed source. So all of that is probably a good thing. And maybe the stock markets will learn a lesson about not counting your chickens before they're hatched, or maybe not. Well, I hope you found this interesting and useful. And we usually have great discussions in the comments below, and I'm sure this topic won't disappoint, so please join in. And if you have information to add or update about this fast-moving topic, that would be most welcome too. If you did enjoy the video, please like and subscribe. It always helps a small channel like this one. And if you have suggestions for a future video, send me an email. And see you next time.